If you have your Bibles, we're going to begin in the 78th Psalm, Psalm 78. Great testimony. How many people know that God hears and answers prayer? He hears and answers prayer. I was saying, I thank God that he condescends. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Why would God care about what I think? Why would God care about my need or your need? Why did he do what he had to do to restore the relationship that had been broken by sin? He didn't have to, but he chose to. We're going to be turning to uh, the 78th Psalm. If you could turn there with me. It's a psalm that recounts uh, the relationship between God and Israel. And if you know your Old Testament, there was a very uh, tumultuous relationship. Not because of God, but because of Israel's hard-heartedness and stubbornness and stiff-necked. And uh, something I was, I, was, I was reading this psalm and something kind of jumped out to me. In, uh, if you look at verse 36... Well, let's just drop back to verse uh, 31. Because I, I don't want to go all the way back to the beginning because it's too long. Verse 31. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. It's talking about in the wilderness. When they would rebel, God would send judgment. He would send uh, correction. It says, for all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him. Isn't that the way it is? When things are going bad, it seems that's when we turn to the Lord. When things are going good, we forget who gives us the power to get wealth. We forget who gives us the power to have health and who touches. We, when things are, are going great, we kind of take him for granted. But when things are going bad, that's when we start to cry out, Oh God. It says, When he slew them, in verse 34, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. You wake up early praying when things ain't going right. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. This is the children of Israel going through the wilderness. Verse 36, Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But how many people, and maybe you found yourself in this position, you flatter God, you say godly things, but deep down inside, maybe not even so deep, you're thinking something totally different. You ever been there? And you give worship and praise to God, but inside there's things turning. Uh, we've all been there one time or another. He says, For their heart was not right with him, in verse 37, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. There's that word covenant again. Verse 38. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not, Many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. I'm glad God turned his anger away from me. There were some times he could have been pretty mad at me. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and comes not again. Now look, verse 40. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness? How often have you provoked God in your wilderness? How often have you grieved him? It says, for they did provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, that was the verse that jumped out at me. The Holy One of Israel. The one who spoke all of creation into existence. The one who, with a mighty hand, brought them out of Egypt. Parted the Red Sea. Gave them manna in the wilderness. Water in the desert. 
fought their battles for them as they were going to the promised land. You know, God brought them to the promised land in two years. And if you read the passage, it says they could have got there in about eight days. But the word says over in Exodus, it says they weren't ready for war yet. For those two years that God took them to Sinai, gave them the covenant of the law, which is this word covenant that we saw here a couple times. He gave them the covenant of the law, and he created them and made them a nation. He forged a nation that was his people. And after two years, he took them to the edge of the promised land. Some of us know the story. It's in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. You can read that when you get a chance. Took them to the edge of the promised land, and he said, All right, land flowing with milk and honey, this is it. You're right just across the border of the blessings I've promised you. They got 12 spies, one from each tribe, and sent them in and said, check the place out. So I believe God allowed them to do that, that they would be tested. Because when they went into that promised land, they saw two things. They saw blessings. They said, man, when they came back, they carried clusters of grapes that took two men to carry. They, they said, this place is laid out. Man, it's flowing with milk and honey. Oh, but there's a problem. There's an obstacle. Out of the 12 spies, 10 of them came back and they said, we can't take it. There's giants in the land. There's uh, Amorites and Hittites and Jebusites and all these, and they have walled cities, and they're big. <laughs> man, they're big in there. They got guys like Goliath in there, man. They were like nine-foot big guys. And they said, we're like, gra we're like grasshoppers. We're nobody. And two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, wait a minute. God took us out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea, gave us water in the desert, gave us manna in the desert, gave us all the food that we needed, took, gave us quail, gave us uh, all this other stuff, and, and, and uh, defeated our, our enemies on the way here, made us his people, gave us a tabernacle where we can go in and make offerings, gave us sacrifices and all these things. He did all these things for us. Why can't he, why can't he conquer these giants? Let's go, guys. Come on, let's go. And the ten spies said, the other ten said, no. And guess who the people believed? They started murmuring. And they said, oh, why would you bring us here? We're going back to Egypt. And God said, okay. Now, God could have put them in the land. As a matter of fact, they tried to go in later. <laughs> it didn't work. God could have put them in there. He could have done that. He could have said, I'm going to throw, I said I was going to do it, I'm going to do it anyhow. But he didn't. They limited him. How did they limit him? Didn't he have the power? Of course he had the power. But he is a covenant God. And he only acts in relation to the covenant that he has with his people. So not that he didn't have the power to do it. Of course he could do it. He's God. He can do anything he wants. But he's not going to break his covenant. He's not going to break his promise. Because if you read through the, the covenant of the law, it's, it's, it's all full of if, then. If you do this, then I'll do this. If you don't do this, then... I, okay, so they weren't, they weren't believing. They limited him with their unbelief. Now, man isn't more powerful than God. But God is not a man that he should lie. Okay? Now, keeping that in mind, I, I want to look at a, just a couple passages of Scripture because sometimes we find ourselves at the edge of our promised land. How many people know what I'm talking about? We find ourselves at the edge of our promised land. And just as we get ready to step in, something comes along and tells us, no, you can't do that. How many have giants they're looking at? you got giants you look at. Some, some, the giants show up. And they, and they say, you can't, you can't have that. You can't receive that. You're not going to see your kids saved. 
After all these years, you're not going to see your loved ones. You're not going to get your healed. You're not going to be, you're not going to have your needs met. What do you, who do you think you are? You're a nobody. See, and them, and, them, and, them, and them obstacles that appear to us, they look like they're giants. And if we come up against them giants in our own strength, sure enough, we're going to get beat down. We try, to, we try to deal with it in ourselves. But listen, we have a God, just like they had a God, that did all these miraculous works. I have a God that saved me out of sin and death. Do you think he can take me to my promised land? And I'm not talking riches. I'm, don't write that off on me. I'm just saying whatever God has promised you. Okay, now look at a couple things with me. I would just look at a couple passages of Scripture. Turn over to Mark. We're going to go in the New Testament and look at Jesus here, all right? Uh, Mark chapter 6. And starting at verse, and starting at verse 1. It says, Jesus had just brought a young, young girl back to, back to life in chapter 5. And it says, and when he went out from thence and came into his own country, came into his hometown, his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Jesus did not have any credentials. He didn't study under any rabbi. But being in, in those days when they would meet in the synagogue, the men of the city would take turns reading the word. Okay. He began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? He said, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. He said, what? wait a minute, for 30 years, this guy's been like nobody. The neighborhood carpenter, the neighborhood guy. Now all of a sudden, he's preaching words with authority. He never went away to college. He never went away to rabbi school. But now when he, when he would go to the synagogue, and there was a good chance that there were times in the past where he would go to the synagogue and take his turn just like any other man in the community. But now all of a sudden, he's speaking words that were like a hammer. Anointed words. Anointed by the Holy Ghost that were like a hammer. When we speak God's word under the anointing, it's like a hammer that breaks things. It's like a, it's like a, it's power. It, it doesn't really matter who's speaking the word. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks the oath. So for, for all, for 30 years, Jesus was a nobody from nowhere, a, a local guy who everybody knew. And all of a sudden he starts, not only was he starting to say things that were causing, having effect, but he was doing things. He was healing people. He was raising, he just raised a girl from the dead. He was doing all these mighty miracles. And, and where did he get, where'd this come from? And it says they were offended at him. They were offended. He said, who is, who is this guy? Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Some of you know this as well as I do. The hardest people to talk to are the ones that grew up with you. Because they knew you. <laughs> and it says in verse 5, your children, they remember before you were saved. Brothers and sisters, cousins, family members, I recently went to a, a funeral of somebody who was related to my grandmother. You know, my grandmother had like, I don't know, probably like 10 siblings. And, and they, all these people that, 
know me, but I don't necessarily remember them. Because maybe they knew me when I was like this. And I go to these places. My brother and I went down to the funeral this, this last week. And everybody's coming to me saying, Carmen. I'm saying, hi. And I'm thinking to myself, who are you? <laughs> but I knew some of them. See, they remember me when I was like this. And when I was like this, I was nothing to write home about. Okay. The hardest people. Okay, now listen. And it says in verse 5, listen to what it says. And he could there do no mighty work. He couldn't do it. Why? But Jesus, is he, he's God. He's the Messiah. It says in the last chapter, he just raised a girl from the dead. But why couldn't he do it where he grew up? He was limited. Why? Because while he is the almighty God in flesh. He works according to his covenant. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. I really believe if he would have done any, many mighty works there, in other places, it says they, they accounted his miracle working power to the devil. Beelzebub. That's what it says. In another place, it says he could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. It says in verse 6, he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the village's teaching. In another place, he said, listen, if the works that you saw here would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. We take things for granted. If some places in the world had the blessings that we have, there's some places, and we've had people here, missionaries here, there's some places where they'll, they'll have two or 300 people gather around in one place with one Bible. Man, we got them laying all over the place collecting dust. We got all, everything that God, that we would think we would need to experience God's blessing, yet we just treat it like it's just you know, a magazine on, on the coffee table. Okay. A couple more, a few more things. Over Matthew chapter 21. Turn there. Okay. And uh, this is one we hear a lot. We especially hear this one a lot when people are trying to raise money. We're not trying to raise money this morning. Amen. Look at verse uh, Matthew chapter 21. Let's start with verse 17. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now, this is, this is the last week of his life before the crucifixion. Now, in the morning, as he returned into the city, he was hungry. And he saw a fig tree in the way, and he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And he said to it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. I'm thinking to myself, what did that fig tree do to him? <laughs> it's a picture. The fig tree is a picture of who? Israel. And as Jesus came to Israel, his people as their Messiah, and they rejected him. They experienced the curse. And we know that he's going to restore Israel. That's, the Bible teaches us that. But listen to what it says here. Listen to what he said. And when his disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? In other words, Jesus said, Hey, you know, bear no fruit. And it just... And the disciples were, Wow. And Jesus answered and said to him, listen, I say unto you, if you have faith, if you believe, and you don't doubt. See, God, God help us. We, we're doubting people. It's easy to doubt. Especially easy to doubt if you've been let down so many times. How many people here, somebody has let you down. Sometimes you don't know what to believe. But listen to what Jesus is saying to his disciples. If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. 
Now, see, I, I said this, the people like to use the scripture when they're trying to raise money because they try to talk people into, into thinking, hey, if you just send me your money, you'll get whatever you want. Okay, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the obstacles. He's talking about the giants. Because, see, when he was walking here, again, this is, this is Old Testament covenant here. He, when he was walking here, his, his own, the leaders of his own nation had become his obstacles. They were, they were opposing the plan of God. Jesus is talking about the obstacles that are trying to keep you from your promised land, whatever it might be. The thing you've been praying for, the thing you've been waiting for, the thing you've been yearning for, the thing you've been calling out for. He said, if there's an obstacle, speak to it in the name of Jesus. And believe that when you speak to your obstacle, it's going to be moved. It's going to be moved. Now, he's, he's saying this. This is before the cross. This is before the blood. This is before the sacrifice. This is before the Lamb of God took, the, took upon him the sin of the world. What about now? This is faith. You know, people were saved by faith from the very beginning to the end of this Bible, from the very beginning of history. Salvation comes by faith. But we have something so much more precious than they had. See, when he was talking to his disciples, they were, they were thinking about a cross. They weren't thinking about a sacrifice. They were thinking about the king. They were thinking about Messiah. They were thinking about the, the, the earthly kingdom of God. They had no clue. They hadn't been listening to what Jesus was saying. They didn't know about a cross or being sacrificed, death, burial, and resurrection. He was trying to tell them they weren't listening. But what about now? One more place I want you to turn with me. Well, maybe a couple more places. Over in James, and this is one I think, I think we probably all know, uh, since we're not running too late this morning. James chapter 1. Come on, we know it. He says in verse 2, he says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. When, when the pressure starts coming, hey, be happy. When troubles start to come, have joy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knowing this, this is why we can have joy, okay? That the trying of your faith, it's a good thing when you've got troubles. Somebody says, Lord, help me. I don't, I don't want any good things. Because whenever our faith is tested, what do we get? We get patience. You don't have to ask for it. People say, don't pray for patience. You're going to get it whether you ask for it or not if you're his. <laughs> Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work. What's the, what is patience supposed to do? That we may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We're supposed to grow up. Amen. So when troubles come our way, when people get in our face, when things ain't working the way we want them to work, when we're not getting what we, want to, what we think we ought to have. See, we ought to thank God. Why? Because it's, it's working to perfect us or to complete us, to make us look like Jesus. It says this. If you lack wisdom, anybody here lack wisdom? Amen. I'll put my hand up. <laughs> Ask God. God, what's going on? I'll tell you if you want to hear it. Let him ask God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. God wants to tell us what's going on. He doesn't want to hide things from us. He doesn't want to keep us you know, in the dark. He wants to reveal to us. It's his desire. You know, the revelation is an unveiling. Okay? But let him, listen, when you ask, ask in what? Faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable. When you ask for one thing and act like you're expecting another. I always use this example. 
If I say, Lord, help me lose weight, and I eat 12 donuts every day, that's, that's being a double-minded man. I'm unstable. <laughs> I ain't right. <laughs> we do that sometimes. We say, oh, Lord, heal my body, and we keep doing the same thing that put us where we are. All right. Okay. Now, one more, one more, over, one more book. Over in, over in Hebrews. Now, Hebrews is a wonderful letter. Don't know who wrote it. Some say Paul did, but, but just, one time I preached a message on the book of Hebrews. I call it the better way. Jesus is a better way. For, for a couple thousand years, the Jews lived under that old covenant of the law that they couldn't keep. They couldn't keep it for 40 days. Moses was up on the mountain. They took the covenant of the law. Moses was up on the mountain. 40 days later, they made a golden calf. We're lucky if we go 40 minutes. <laughs> okay? Can't keep it. But listen, here's what Hebrews says. If you read the whole book, it's a better way. We got a better covenant. We got a better Savior. We got a better promise. We got a better everything. A better high priest is better. Because the old one, all it could do is keep reminding us of how far we fall short. But the new one provides something for us that the old one didn't. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. And we'll read verse 14, and we're going to go to one more place, and we're done, I promise. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. See, he, if you read this whole passage, it talks about in the Old Testament, they, they would have a high priest. And that high priest, every year, would have to go into the holy place and make an offering on the Day of Atonement. And when that high priest died, there had to be another priest come in. And the high priest had to make an offering for himself because he was a sinner. And all these things had to go on. He said... But now, we don't have to go to a, a, an earthly, a human high priest that would die and have to be replaced. But we have a greater high priest who is who? It's Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That means let us keep believing. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus knows how you feel. When you're abandoned, when you're alone, when you're scared, whatever you're going through, Jesus understands. A lot more than I ever could or anybody else ever could. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. Now, listen, let us come boldly, confidently. That's what that word means. It doesn't mean arrogantly. Let us come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Under this new covenant, this better covenant that we're, that, that we're under, we don't have to bring bulls and rams and goats to a temple. But what we, all we need to do is to go to the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus and make our request known to God. There's no obstacle that can keep us from that place. The only obstacles are the ones that we allow to stand. Because we have the power to speak to the mountain and say, be removed. We have a power to speak to the giants and say, be gone in the name of Jesus. And we can approach the throne of grace by the, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. He said, come on in. Come on in. How often do we approach the throne of grace but, and we'll, we'll go so far, but then we'll stop. Say, oh. No, I can't, I can't go that far. But Jesus says, you can come in. You can come in. You don't need, you don't need a, a basin full of blood because that's already been offered. Okay. One more. Over in Hebrews chapter 10. I don't usually jump around like this, but I just thought we would look at God's word a little bit. And starting at verse... Look at verse uh, 15. No, I just, we we got to go back a little further now. Wait a minute. Lou's going to get mad at me. Up. Look at verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, meaning Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Say, say forever. That means forever. It means there's no more. There's no more sacrifice. It's done. 
It's, you're either going to be saved by faith in Christ or you ain't going to be saved. He sat down. Now listen to what, listen what Jesus did. He sat down on the right hand of the God of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The Creator of the universe. The Father, the Heavenly Father. The Eternal Son sat down on the right hand, the place of power. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by, hallelujah. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are, what? Sanctified. You have been perfected by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? You haven't been perfected by your church attendance. You haven't been perfected by your, your tithing. You haven't been perfected by your worship. All that stuff is okay. We're perfected by the blood of Christ. And nothing else. We can't add nothing to it. Wherefore, in verse 15, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. Here's the new covenant. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Hallelujah. See, we got, we got a new thing. And their sins and iniquities will I remember? No. Hallelujah. He set him aside. See, see, he knows, I mean, you know, God, he, he knows what happened from the very beginning to the end. It's not like he just, they like disappear and he's like a senile old man. But he set him aside. He doesn't hold them against us anymore. He's not going to bring them up to us anymore. Huh? You ever bring stuff up to people after 20 years and say, hey, you remember what you did? He, he's not going to bring that stuff up anymore. It's done. It's covered with the blood. Now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. There's nothing else we can do. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by... There we go. Entering into the, blood, to the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near. Cross over into your promised land. Don't be afraid of the giants and the obstacles because they're defeated. They're not defeated by us, by our willpower, by our wisdom, by our strength. They're defeated by the blood of Jesus Christ. you got to believe it. If you don't believe it, you'll stand on the other side of that border just looking over there, just yearning, yearning, yearning. But all we got to do is believe. Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, a better way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us come to God. If we're going to ask him for something, let's believe that we're going to have it. And if he's not going to give it to us, he's going to tell us why. He has condescended to become one of us. He didn't have to. But how often do we tie his hands? Because we just won't believe. Reading a little bit more here and we're going to close up. Okay. Oh, it's, it's only 11 o'clock. We're doing good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let us draw near in verse 22. With a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without. For he is faithful that has promised. And let us consider one another to provoke us unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, when we come together here on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night, we come together that we might be able to say to one another, God will get you through. I know God will get you through because he got me through. I know God will meet your need because he met my need. I know, see, we need to exhort one another. When, because every once in a while, we, we'll, start getting, we'll start losing our faith. Come on, you ever, you ever start doubting in your mind? I'm talking about seasoned Christians who have been saved for 50 years. Get to places sometimes where they're wondering, God, what are you doing? I don't understand why it's not happening the way I think it ought to happen. 
That's when we need to come together and somebody needs to come alongside them and say, brother, I'm praying for you. It's going to, God's going to do what he said he's going to do. God's going to take you into your promised land. God's going to give you what he said he was going to give you. Listen, you keep, your, you keep believing what he had said, and don't doubt, and don't start, don't start letting the, the obstacles and the giants come against you and make you feel like, like God has not heard you. God, every time you open your mouth, if you're saved, when you open your mouth, God hears you. Matter of fact, he hears you when you don't open your mouth. We have the spirit of adoption. We cry, Abba, Father. God knows. You know, come on, parents, moms, you know when your baby cried. You know what it sounds like. Listen, that's the way God is. He knows where we're at. You may be doubting him today. You might be in a place where you say, God, I don't know what you're doing. It's all right. He'll bring you through. See, it says in my Bible, over in Philippians chapter 2, when the Jesus came here, he didn't come as a superman, powerful. But he said, he emptied himself, became a servant, and was obedient unto death. He condescended to be like one of us. He condescended to be like you and me. So that when we go through our hard times, we can say, Lord, do you hear me? I want to tell you this morning, he hears you. I guarantee you, he hears you. Not because I have some kind of inward, but because that's what this word says. And if you're holding on to something, if you're waiting to cross over into your promised land, don't let them obstacles stand in your way. Don't let those giants say, oh, you ain't coming in here. Don't you think you're a grasshopper in the eyes of God? Listen, you're more than a conqueror. Through faith in Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, how many people are on the end of your promised land and you're looking over the border and you just can't, you just can't see yourself crossing over? I want to let you know there's a way. You know, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to come up here and we're just going to pray. If you need prayer, if you've been empty, if you find yourself, if you find yourself weak, if you find yourself doubting, if you just don't think God will do it for you, just come, just come up here and stand. We're going to pray. We're going to seek the Lord. I'm going to ask you, if, if, if those of you who are out there, could you stand just where you're at and just stand and pray with me as we pray for these? We're going to pray and we're going to close. We're going to pray and we're going to close. Come on up and just take hands. All right, just join hands with one another. God knows. God knows. God knows where you're at. He knows where you're coming from. He knows where you've been. He knows what you need. We've got lots of room. Come on. If you want to come up, just come. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. We're on the end, end of our promised land. Father, every, the spies are telling us we can't make it. The spies, the, the giants are saying, don't you cross over. Oh, no. Don't you try to come over here. I'll take care of you. Listen, greater is he who is in a man. We quote that scripture over and over and over again. And the reason why we do, because it's so good. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. He's greater than that giant. He's greater than that obstacle that's in front of you right now. Don't limit his hands. Don't tie his hands this morning. But believe that he is able. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. These ones have come. If, if any else want to come, come on up. Just come and stand. We're just going to pray a prayer of faith. We're not going to lay hands. We're just going to pray a prayer of faith. Well, maybe we might lay hands. <laughs> We're just going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.